what is truth? And how does it lead to reconciliation? These are questions I've been asking myself for the past decade. On August 9, 2015, I found myself in the middle of a crowd of protesters who showed up on a blazing hot Sunday morning in Ferguson, Missouri, to remember the life of Mike Brown Jr. and to call for truth, justice, and accountability for a life that was taken too soon. But it wasn't just his death we were lamenting. It was all of the men, women, boys and girls of color who had been gunned down by police in this country. Their only crime? The color of their skin. I know I'm an imperfect messenger for this story. The color of my skin betrays me. My upbringing along the banks of the Mississippi Delta in the Deep South indoctrinated me in the long, deep-seated racism of my ancestors. My position as a highly educated white woman means that I cannot relate to experiences of oppression. It means that I can teach about institutional racism and structural violence against communities of color, but I cannot know it because I have not lived it. I am an imperfect messenger. But this doesn't stop me for calling for justice for Mike Brown, Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland, and all of the other African Americans whose lives have been snuffed out because of this country's suspicion, and dare I say it, hatred towards people of color. Am I speaking my truth? No. If I were speaking my truth, it might sound something like this. I was born in West Memphis, Arkansas in 1984 to a white middle-class family. Both of my parents grew up poor. Their parents grew up in real poverty. All four of my grandparents picked cotton to help their family survive the Great Depression. I come from a long line of poor Southern whites. Good people, hard workers, never relied on anyone for anything. My parents grew up in the age of Jim Crow segregation. My father lived in Little Rock, Arkansas, when Central High School needed the National Guard to oversee desegregation. My mother lived in Greensboro, North Carolina, when civil rights activists conducted sit-ins at lunch counters throughout the city. I tell you these stories so that you can better understand the context of my upbringing. In 1984, the year I was born, Ronald Reagan was elected to his second term in office in a landslide victory. He won 49 of 50 states. The America I was born into was socially conservative. America, in short, was a red state. It was also the era in which the war on drugs began, ushering in a period of mass incarceration described by Michelle Alexander as the new Jim Crow because of the ways in which it effectively ruined the lives of millions of African Americans in similar fashion to the Jim Crow era. I tell you this so that you can understand the dark and often subtle ways in which racism shaped my life. The America of my youth was no place for people of color. It was a place of white privilege. And although the very same America elected its first African American president in 2008, I would argue that America still struggles with insidious racism. So as I stand here before you today, acknowledging my white privilege, I must confess that it took many years for me to shed the racist skin in which I was bred and to come to a place where I could call for truth and justice to decry institutional racism and call for action to end it. When I was just leaving home and college for the first time, it was hard to imagine the world as being anything other than what I had experienced in 22 years of life. It's easy to use our experiences as a frame of reference for the world around us. It wasn't until I traveled to Northern Ireland and then South Africa that I began to see the parallels in the histories of oppression of other people. In my travels to South Africa in 2008, I learned that the authors of apartheid developed a system of racial separation and oppression based on the very same Jim Crow laws my parents' generation grew up with. This was the first time I encountered a truth that was different from the ones I had embodied in my youth. 
This is what led me on a journey in search of truth. Not just any truth, though. The kind of truth that has the potential to lead to reconciliation between former enemies. In my travels to South Africa and Northern Ireland, I met with victims and survivors of the Troubles and apartheid, and I asked them about their truths, what it would take for them to forgive their perpetrators, and what was necessary for reconciliation. I learned that truth could be healing for some, but deepen the pain for others. I found that forgiveness was a highly personal process between individual victims and perpetrators, but that reconciliation was a practice best pursued on a national level so that societies can move towards peaceful coexistence. Perhaps most importantly, I learned that few things have greater power in healing and reconciliation than truth. Archbishop Desmond Tutu, the chairman of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, once said, forgiving and being reconciled to our enemies or our loved ones are not about pretending that things are other than they are. It is not about patting one another on the back and turning a blind eye to the wrongs. True reconciliation exposes the awfulness, the abuse, the hurt, the truth. I believe this now, but when I began this journey, I found Tutu's words confusing. I couldn't understand how such a bold confrontation of reality could ever lead to reconciliation between two people, let alone healing and forgiveness. Truth made me uncomfortable because it forced me to face realities that were inconvenient and painful. It forced me to look at the past and to see how pains visited upon people had happened in my own country by my ancestors and by the leaders of my country. It made me see how institutional racism had resulted in white privilege. It made me see how I had benefited from the exploitation of others. And it made me see how my silence about injustice made me complicit in its practice. Indeed, it was an unsettling truth. But then I realized there was hope in truth, hope for healing, hope for forgiveness, hope for reconciliation, and hope for creating a just and peaceful society. This is my story about how what began as an educational journey in search of truth in other parts of the world led me on a journey in search of truth and reconciliation in Ferguson and beyond. It took a long time for me to arrive at a place where I could advocate for truth, justice, and reconciliation. It took me years to shed the racist skin in which I was bred before I could call for justice against institutional racism. I'd like to return now to two questions that I posed to you at the beginning. What is truth, and how does it lead to reconciliation? Truth is a difficult concept to pin down. I'm not talking about absolute truths, like the fact that we all need air to breathe. I'm talking about subjective truths, the kinds of truths that are based on our own experiences, beliefs, and perceptions of the world. Can subjective truths be based on facts? Absolutely. Mike Brown is dead. He was killed by a police officer. These are indisputable facts that are part of the truth of what happened in Ferguson. The rest of the narrative is murky. Did Officer Wilson fear for his life, resulting in him shooting Brown? Did Brown have his hands up? This is the gray area where the facts are uncertain and people draw their own conclusions. Based on their experiences with police, some individuals may come to the conclusion that Mike Brown posed no threat to Officer Wilson and that he was gunned down because of the color of his skin. This is their truth. Others may assert that Officer Wilson acted within the confines of the law and used his best judgment when firing his weapon. This is their truth. But these truths 
are incompatible and more likely to lead to division than to reconciliation. Now, imagine how much harder it must be when hundreds and thousands of similar incidents have occurred. How can these truths ever lead to reconciliation between two people? How can these truths ever be reconciled into one cohesive narrative? Let us go back to what Desmond Tutu told us about truth and reconciliation. He told us that we should not turn a blind eye to the wrongs. Instead, we must confront the truth. In confronting the realities of what happened in Ferguson, we are forced to see that a young man lost his life on the streets of his own neighborhood in August 2014. We are also forced to interrogate the reasons why Officer Wilson felt it necessary to kill Brown. And we are forced to examine the reasons why this continues to happen across the US on such a significant scale. When we confront these realities, we are forced to see how our country's racist past, spanning centuries, is still present in policing and criminal justice today. Now, while I respect the hardworking, honest men and women that form our police force in this country, I submit to you that institutional racism in policing and criminal justice is undeniable. That is what Tutu meant when he said that we cannot turn a blind eye to wrongs. And this is where truth leads to reconciliation. Truth-telling processes, whether they be small-scale ventures carried out on the community level or society-wide truth commissions, compel us to confront the truth of injustice. Truth-telling, according to Michael Ignatieff, narrows the range of permissible lies. I would add to that that by narrowing the range of permissible lies, the ground is paved for an honest acknowledgement and apology by wrongdoers for the injustices they have committed. In societies like South Africa, where acknowledgement and apology have occurred, individual healing and societal reconciliation have had a much greater chance of success. By contrast, in places like Turkey, where the Armenian genocide is continually denied, and the government attempts to control the narrative. Individual healing and societal reconciliation is difficult, if not impossible. That is why it is so important that we confront the realities of institutional racism in this country. Truth can be healing, and it can lead to the kinds of reconciliation that have the power for societal transformation, but only if we are honest with ourselves in dealing with our painful past. So today, I would like to ask each of you to join me in a call to action to narrow the range of permissible lies. Activist, take control of your narrative. Tell your stories and speak truth to power, no matter how difficult this might be. Build a network of like-minded activists and strategize your campaign. Maintain a continuous, nonviolent campaign against racism and injustice. Allies, be honest with yourselves about your own privilege, whatever it may be. Do an honest accounting of the ways in which your upbringing has shaped your views of the world for good and bad. And if necessary, shed your racist skin. Don't be afraid to talk about race and injustice. Show up to support those who are demanding their rights but don't try to take the spotlight. Allow your own views to be challenged. Listen and learn. And to those in power, I would say this. Give activists the safe spaces needed to air their grievances. Facilitate dialogue and look for ways to build trust. Challenge your views and listen to what is being said and look for ways to make positive changes. For without this kind of open dialogue, we cannot hope to achieve justice. If we commit to creating safe spaces for dialogue and learning, we can confront the kind of truth that leads to reconciliation. And this is what we must do if we are seeking justice. Thank you.